I have come across this 1902 edition of The Hound of the Baskerville, one of the stories about Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which needs some help. In the conservation of this Sherlock Holmes volume, it seems only fitting to approach the task with the same meticulous attention to detail as the great detective himself. Just as Holmes would carefully analyze every clue, I examine each aspect of the book's wear and damage, ensuring that nothing is overlooked in bringing it back to life. From the worn spine to the frayed corners, each element requires a precise and deliberate method, akin to solving one of Holmes's intricate mysteries. The work begins with a thorough investigation of the object, ensuring that each step taken will preserve the integrity of the original while seamlessly blend in the new repairs. As with Holmes's many cases, patience and methodical work are key, and no solution is implemented without careful consideration of its potential impact on the whole. With my tools, brushes, tweezers and scalpels acting as my magnifying glass and deerstalker hat, I proceed through the careful process of conservation ever aware that the integrity of the beloved detective's adventures depends on this delicate balance between conservation, restoration and reconstruction. Dry cleaning is always the essential first step in the conservation process. Armed with a soft brush and a smoke sponge, I carefully remove the surface grime and dust. This process is vital for ensuring no stray particles remain on the surface, as they could become embedded in the paper, just as an overlooked detail might compromise a case. By thoroughly cleaning the surface first, I reduce the risk of damaging the paper later. All the pages in the book are gathered into sections, each consisting of four sheets that are folded in the middle and nested within each other. All the sections are joined to form the book block by sewing through the fold of each section. Therefore, every page in the book has a counterpart with which it forms a sheet. And when a page is coming loose, it is being separated from its counterpart. And it is important to find this counterpart so that it can be rejoined. Once I manage to locate the counterpart of the loose page, I can reunite them using Japanese koso paper and wheat starch paste. The coastal paper is torn into smaller pieces and tucked between the sheets in a section and the sewing. One side of the patch is adhered to the loose page and once it has dried, the other side of the patch is adhered to the page's counterpart. Patches are applied on both sides of the sheets to provide extra strength. Every tear in the pages must also be addressed, no matter how small, as even the tiniest tear could worsen. These two are repaired with coso paper and wheat starch paste. For each repair, I place a piece of non-worn polyester and blotter paper on both sides of the tear. The blotter paper absorbs the moisture from the wheat starch paste, speeding up the drying process, while the polyester ensures nothing sticks to the pages. And to prevent any warping of the moistened paper, waste bags are used during drying. When all tears have been repaired and the loose sections reassembled, the excess coso paper is carefully trimmed. By inserting a small piece of wooden cardboard between the pages, I create a stable surface, allowing me to trim the excess with the precision of a sharp scalpel. The book's construction features a hollow back made of cardboard. The purpose of the hollow back is to allow the book to open more fully without damaging the spine. Unfortunately, some parts of the cardboard have gone missing at the head and tail, and I must replace these missing sections of cardboard, as they will be needed later when applying new binding material. I cut a small piece of acid-free cardboard to fill the missing area, ensuring it slightly overlaps the original. If I were to attach the cardboard patch as it is, there would be a very noticeable edge where the new material meets the old, so I thin it out at one end to create a smooth transition between the two pieces, 
and I then adhered with wheat starch paste. To prevent the hollow back from sticking together, just as Holmes would ensure a clean conclusion without unintended complications, I place a piece of non-worn polyester inside while it dries. This guarantees the hollow back remains functional, preserving the original intent. Weight bags are the ideal drying solution here, as they mold to the spine's curve, applying even pressure while drying. As I contemplate how best to insert the new fill-in beneath the old bonding material, I feel much like Holmes deliberating over the best course of action in a delicate case. Ideally, I want to use a single piece of fill-in material, which will need to cover all the areas on the spine where the fabric has failed or is nearing that point. This would be the most seamless solution, much like Holmes' preference for elegant, all-encompassing resolutions. While I can easily lift the binding material on both the covers and the spine, it's becoming clear that the fabric on the spine is so worn that it would be better to apply a new piece over the entire area. If I can apply this in one piece, it would be far more aesthetically pleasing. However, as things stand, it's not feasible because the binding material is still intact at the top of the spine. Though I could attempt to work around this obstacle, the result would likely be untidy. And worse, there's a significant risk of the fabric tearing unpredictably during the process. Therefore, I make the strategic decision to cut the fabric on one side, allowing me to control the location and size of the break, just as Holmes would take command of a situation before it spun out of control. With the fabric cut, I now have full access to the spine, my equivalent of uncovering a hidden clue that opens up the entire case. The new binding material needs to be positioned between the original material and the hollow back, so I must completely detach the hollow back from the binding. Much of it can be peeled away, but the remnants are scraped off with a scalpel. Since the hollow back is made of acidic cardboard, I decide to replace it entirely. This means that the fillings are made earlier are wasted, but sometimes that's just how it goes. I cut a piece of cotton cloth to the correct size and craft a new hollow back from acid-free cardboard. First, I apply wheat starch paste to the cloth and attach the hollow back to it. Then I adhere the cloth with the cardboard to the book. The cloth is glued down onto the covers and wrapped around both the covers and the hollow back, allowing it to sit underneath the original material inside the book as well. As with many of Holmes' complex cases, this process requires patience, working back and forth to ensure everything fits perfectly. Once the cloth is securely in place, I apply a bit more wheat starch paste over the top and reattach the original material. To prevent any missteps, pieces of non-worn polyester are placed inside the covers and under the hollow back, ensuring the wrong parts don't stick together, much like Holmes taking precautions to avoid unforeseen complications. The book is then left to dry under pressure. And once everything is completely dry, I can remove the book and check if the hollow back functions as it should. If we can see all the way through the spine, then the process has succeeded. The binding material at the corners of the book shows wear. The damage is minor at the top corners, but at the bottom material is missing. Additionally, the corners are mashed meaning the layers of the cardboard have started to come apart. To reattach them, I first need to separate the layers as much as possible, and then I glue them back together with wheat starch paste, applying it between the layers using a knife. For the corners where material is missing, I cut a small piece of cloth, and I wrap it around the corner beneath the original material, adhering it with wheat starch paste. 
The original material is also glued down with wheat starch paste and it is left to dry, much like the repairs of the tears in the text block. I place a piece of non-worn polyester and blotter paper on either side of the corner repairs. And to provide stability, I add a piece of wooden cardboard on both sides and hold it all together with a clamp until dry. Once the fill-ins are completely dry, they require retouching, a task akin to the meticulous work Holmes undertakes when refining the details of a case. I employ watercolour for this purpose, a medium I find quite enjoyable to work with. However, watercolour has its drawbacks. It dries lighter than it appears, leaving one in a state of uncertainty about the final outcome until it's fully dried. I maintain a small book where I've tested all my colours, much like Holmes's notes on various suspects and motifs which provides me with a sense of how the hues will translate when dry. Yet, just as Holmes often revisits various elements of a case to gain clarity, I must go over the different areas multiple times, building up layers of color before I'm completely satisfied. This iterative process mirrors Holmes's relentless pursuit of truth, ensuring that every detail is just right before the case or, in this instance, the conservation is complete. Now, as the conservation of this Sherlock Holmes book has come to an end, one can see how each step of the process mirrored Holmes' method, thorough, patient, and always with an eye for detail, just as Holmes would piece together the fragments of an apparently unsolvable case the book's many elements have been meticulously preserved, ensuring that it can continue its adventure without further decay. As Holmes often remarked, it's not about seeing, but about observing. The book's history is now preserved, not merely through repairs, but through careful attention to the subtle details that ensure its continued survival. Once again, it can be opened, read and admired without fear of falling apart, ready to lead readers on yet another adventure through Holmes's sharp observations and brilliant deductions.